Okay, uh, if you have a Bible, would you turn with me to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 as we continue through uh, the Bible, Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, and there's ushers coming down the aisles with Bibles. If you don't have one, just get their attention, and they will uh, um, get one to you. 2 Samuel 11. Today we're going to talk about the way of escape. The way of escape. How to keep your freedom. How to not ruin your life in sin. And uh, this is just the next thing that comes up in the Bible. And this is really helpful for Christians. Would you guys imagine with me for a minute that you're driving down a freeway that's still under construction. It's not completed yet. And the end of the freeway where it's not completed yet Um, it just plunges off a cliff. Now, each mile that you're driving along that new freeway, uh, there's these exits or off-ramps that are calling out to you. (laughs) Signs, take this exit, road out three miles, you know. Exit here, off-ramp, two miles, danger, those kind of things, one mile. Um, Uh, I would like you to keep that picture in your mind because what happens in this chapter is when somebody ignores those warnings, those off-ramps, and they just keep driving until they crash and burn. And of course, God doesn't want us to crash and burn. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians that um, the Old Testament scriptures were written down for us as examples for our admonition. That means like to get our attention so that we wouldn't do the dumb things that they did. And even if we do, or it's coming at us, he tells us next, and I want to show you 1 Corinthians 10, 13, what to do. Look what he said. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. Remember that, such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. This is one of the most powerful and hopeful verses in the whole Bible. Mark it, please, in your mind, because it's giving you a strategy, because everybody gets tempted. Everybody does, but it's what you do with it. Go this way. Get off of this path. Go to safety. So we're going to look at how a godly person falls into sin here in chapter 11. And it leads to worse problems because he doesn't take the way uh, of escape. That's all he had to do. And it would have made things better for him. So would you, as we go through this, do something with me? Would you just kind of look at the off-ramp, look, uh, uh, find the off-ramps with me (laughs) as we go through this chapter? Because there's off-ramps that he could have taken and you and I can take and apply it to our own life. And, uh, and maybe we can learn something from this to protect ourselves, okay? So let's start here in verse 1 of chapter 11, 2 Samuel. And here's what the author said. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out into battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Okay, a little background here. You know, this book is about the triumphs and troubles in the life of David. And we've, we're coming up to the troubles now, but we've seen a lot of triumph uh, so far. We've seen the nation of Israel. It's at the height of its strength, and, and David's being used by God mightily. Their enemies have been pushed back. There's peace and safety in the land. David is a very popular king now, and things are going well for him. God has blessed his life. He's about 50 years old about this time, and he's got everything he needs and and more. (laughs) And so it's interesting that now we come to probably the most tragic thing that's ever happened to him. And it starts with kind of an innocent thing. His army is at battle but he stayed behind, we're told. You know, in my library at home, uh, lots of the commentaries make quite a big deal about David staying back. Because, um, believe it or not, war back then was often seasonal. (laughs) 
you know, once winter rolled around, they would like call a timeout. <laughs> And then they'd pick it up again in the spring. It was like baseball season, you know? It's kind of weird, but that's what they did. And that's what's happening here. Now they're back to war season. Uh, and the kings would typically go out with their men when war season would start. But David didn't. And so many of the scholars say that this was his first downfall. And maybe it is. We're not sure, but it could be. Here's my point, if we go back to that verse that I shared with you, he could still resist the temptation that was about to come, couldn't he? Even if he was in the wrong place, you can still, because the Lord just told us that you can. And so I think it's kind of wrong to think that this thing led to his downfall. I'd say more than what led to his downfall, that he had multiple wives and concubines, that he was kind of uh, like, you know, women was a weakness for David, and I think that shows more in these things that we're about to see than anything else. Well, verse 2, it says, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Uh, in Israel in that day, the, the roofs, the houses had flat roofs that they would use for additional living space. And, and David's palace was on the hillside above some of the homes below. And you can actually go there today and see it. We have a, a picture of kind of the, the uh, point of view that you would see because archaeologists have excavated the city of David and they've uncovered all of this. And so I'll tell you what, I've been there and I've stood there and it's a really strange feeling to, to stand there and look down on the roofs below knowing what's about to happen in this chapter. But I wanted you to see that so you could, you know, you could see what's going on in the roof uh, below and that's what's happening here. So he said there in verse two, there's this beautiful gal uh, washing herself. Now, why she's washing herself on the roof, <laughs> it's, it's no, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Maybe she thought everybody was sleeping. It's late at night, perhaps. Or maybe she's put herself in a place she shouldn't be. Maybe she's not being modest. I don't know. We're not told much about it. But whatever the reason, David sees her. And you know, the way that it's written, it seems like he doesn't just like glance, he, he gazed long at, at her. You usually can't help seeing most things the first time, right? Because it just comes into your field uh, of vision. But David Guzik, in his commentary, he said, our eyes are supposed to bounce off of alluring images. <laughs> and that's some good counsel right there. And that's what he should have done. So that would have been, here's the first off-ramp, <laughs> in case you're playing along with me. Uh, his first way of escape should be if not to stared, right? So if you've got things going on in your life where alluring images are problematic for you, know that there is an off-ramp for that, and you just stop it, right? And that's what he should have done. He, he should have escaped from it. Well, verse 3 says, So David went, sent, and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Okay, so he's taking the next step now, right? Because he didn't take the off-ramp. And he finds her attractive. Now, obviously God has made us attracted to one another. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, over time, that's how the race, the human race continues as we're attracted um, to one another. But if she's married, that's where it should stop, right? And David's also married. So my question is, why is he even asking about her? So now we come to exit number two, right? He could get off. Oh, she's married? Okay. <laughs> I'm out or whatever, you know? You'd think that his other wives and concubines would satisfy him. But here's something that's really helpful to know about the human condition. You can't satisfy the lust of the flesh. It doesn't matter how much you get. It's not enough. 
There's never enough money to satisfy the flesh. There's never enough alcohol. There's never enough excitement. There's never enough fun. There's never, there's just never enough whatever. That's why the, the Apostle Paul uh, gave us such great, great counsel in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. And maybe we could all say this together as a church. Can you repeat this with me? He said this, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's the best protection that we have right there. We walk in the spirit and then I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, like what he's doing. If he walked in the spirit, this wouldn't be happening here. What's going to happen? Now, on top of all that, before I go on, the, this family that he, that he was just told about was close to his family. They're friends. And Uriah is one of his key army leaders, and yet he's going to mess it all up. The allure has grabbed a hold of him. I imagine him start working around in his mind like Uriah. Oh, he's away at battle. Huh, I could totally get away with this. So what does he do? Verse four, then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and she lay with her. He lay with her for she was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house. Okay, so the sin of adultery has been committed now. Another man's wife. He was tempted, should have taken the way of escape, right? But he didn't, so now it's like this runaway train. I'm wondering, and you know, I try not to speculate too much when I go through the word, but I'd like to use my imagination too. And I wonder if he's like a little power hungry because things have been going so great for him, because that's how people can get, you know? And I wonder if he's like, you know what? I deserve her because I'm the king. And as a matter of fact, when we get into chapter 12, it looks like that's when Nathan busts him, that that's kind of what he's saying. You know, and here's David like starting to justify his lust because of who he is. Um, The apostle John said there's three things that are of the world and not of God. He said the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And to me, it looks like kind of all three of those are going on here, and it's, it's leading to his ruin. Now, I like to not blame David for all of it. I mean, he, he's certainly to blame here, a big part of it. He's the pursuer. But it takes two to tango, doesn't it? And she doesn't seem very reluctant to me. Does she f- seem very reluctant to you? I mean... She could have said no, right? (laughs) She could have. Those messengers show up at her door, like, David wants you to go to the palace. What does he want me at the palace for? Tell him I'm taking a shower. (laughs) You know, I'm busy. Or maybe she's like, oh, the king wants to see me. Oh, I gotta go. Even if she did go and the king starts to make advantage, she's married. You know, she could say, stop. You know, she could have done that, but she doesn't. She goes along with it, too. Well, you can probably guess what happened. Verse 5, it says, And the woman conceived. And so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Um, You know, this was before modern birth control. So, I mean, David had to know this was a possibility. uh, And yet they went ahead with it anyway. And. I, I was, again, imagining that David starts to think that the rules don't apply to him. Because that's how people can get, you know? you know? Back in the day when I was a kid, <laughs> the parents used to say, you've gotten too big for your britches. <laughs> and I think he's gotten too big for his britches, and that can happen to us, too, you know, full of ourselves. I feel invincible. Nothing can go wrong. But here's the kicker. <laughs> the rules apply to all of us, especially this one. And you're not supposed to go there. And he did. And so now it's a mess. So what's he going to do? Well, you can, you can probably think of what he should do, but David is going to devise a three-step plan now, and I want to take you through it. Plan A, B, and C. And here's plan A, starting with verse 6 through 9. 
It says, then David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. <clears throat> As I was reading this for the first time, I thought, did the Lord prevent him from going down to his house? Like it just occurred to me that God may have like not allowed him to go down there, you know. What should have David have done here? He should tell Uriah, right? There's another off-ramp, <laughs> number three here. He's got a way to, to, to stop it. This train that's going off the cliff. He could have told him. You know, the problem, though, with that is, because of what, what's happening, the law said that the adulterers were supposed to be put to death. So now that's got to be weighing on David's mind. Like, I could be put to death for this. And, and so he could have confessed it, but he begins this covering, cover up. He's thinking that, you know, covering it up is going to make things better. I'm going to get out of it. But it's going to make things worse. So he, he pretends, you know, bears false witness to Uriah that he wants an update on the battle. But what he's really hoping is that Uriah will go home and have sex with his wife so then when she comes up pregnant, he will think it's his child, right? That's the whole cover-up now. Maybe she's not that far along and he won't notice yet, and, and David will be in the clear. You see what he's doing with plan A? Except for one problem. What's the problem? <laughs> Uriah won't go home. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, verse 10 says, So when they told David, saying Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go down to my house and eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. <laughs> Man, it's just getting worse for David, isn't it? Uriah is more honorable than he is. I'm not going home when all my bros are out there fighting, you know. I wonder if this really made David feel guilty, like, yeah, I should have done that. I would have never been on the roof. And really, isn't that the message to all of us? Like, you know, not that being on the roof made him sin, but it's like he left this gate open kind of carelessly, and now the thief has come in to rob from him, and it's, it's messed everything up. And, and it's really sad when you see this happen in our lives. Well, then David said to Uriah, wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening, he went, down, went out to lie on his bed with his servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Okay, so now David tries plan B. Here's the next tactic. I know I'll get him drunk. That always works with guys. <laughs> I'll get him drunk, and he'll go home to be uh, with his wife. Except it doesn't. <laughs> Uriah is not going home no matter what. He's just crashing outside the palace again. He's loyal and faithful to David and to the other Israelites. And so now David's desperate. What's he going to do? What should he do? Well, he still can exit. <laughs> he can still get off this crazy thing he's on. Take the way of escape. And even though it's getting worse, he could still do it. Instead... He devises plan C, which is worst of all. Let's read it together, verse 14. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. All right, so now it's progressed to murder. 
conspiracy. The guy's completely lost his moral compass. And this is actually the worst kind of killing. It's premeditated, right? You get the death penalty in Idaho for this kind of stuff. You know, the whole thing started of, of something that was bad, right? The immorality. It's gotten way worse now. And the sin is just like piling up because he's keeping it hidden. Um, James, uh, in his book, teaches in chapter 1 about uh, the progression of sin if we let it take over like he's doing here. And it's a great commentary on it. I just want to show you a couple of verses here. Look what uh, James said. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth what? Death. And that's what we're seeing here, aren't we? Like, it, he was tempted. He could have gotten out of it. But he, he's drawn away by it, and it leads to sin. And then when it keeps getting worse, it eventually leads to death. That's why Jesus said the broad way leads to destruction. And many go that way. But God has a way that will not lead to ruin. And our desire should be to walk on on his path. There's another verse here I wanted you guys to say with me. Maybe we could commit this to memory. It's from Psalm 119. And look how uh, he said, can we say this one together too? He, he said, make me walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. Isn't that great? Lord, help me, urge me, make me go your way. And then I won't do these things, right? It's another way of saying walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, if we retrace David's steps, he's had a way of escape many times. Lots of opportunities to take the royal road exit. <laughs> Could have avoided a lot of pain. You know, before I go on, one of the things that really gets me about this is that poor Uriah had to carry his own death sentence in his pocket. I mean, that David would stoop so low to make him do that. Isn't that awful? It is awful. And folks, could we just for a moment agree that this kind of thing is in the heart of mankind? And it's because we have free will. And because we have free will, people can choose all sorts of depraved and disgusting things to do. Even believers. And so, we can't emphasize enough how important it is to have a close relationship with God every single day. Because we're capable of anything. And then when we're tempted to remember what Paul said and take the way of escape. Take the way of escape. Take the way of escape. So it was, verse 16, while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. That poor guy. He had no idea this was going on. Well, he does now, <laughs> right? You know, he's like, seriously? <laughs> That's how I died? <laughs> David's a jerk, man. <laughs> you know. And now, you see, David's got Joab dragged into it. He's like an accomplice in the whole thing. And then there in verse 17, other people start dying because of it. What a mess. And this is what sin does if you take it out far enough. And you know, it's good to remember that, um, you know, people don't usually ruin their lives with one thing. <laughs> I mean, it's usually one thing that, that really kind of pushes it off the edge. But usually it's a series of things leading up to it. It's things that can be stopped. <laughs> and, um, you know, and there's a way out. Well, then Joab, I'm going to read down to verse uh, 21. Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath arises, and he says to you, 
why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the, the son of Jerubbesheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Okay, Joab is letting the messenger know that if David starts to kind of pop a cork when the bad news of the battle comes to him, he goes, just tell him Uriah is dead. He'll be happy then. This is referring to that incident in Judges 9 where the gal dropped the rock on Abimelech's head from the tower because he was standing too close to it. And so Joab's just saying, this is the kind of the same thing that's happening here. Just say, just say, David, it happened just like you wanted, okay? So everything's okay. So the messenger, verse 22, went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. And then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. This is almost the saddest part of the whole thing to me. I mean, it just, it gets worse and worse. But he's essentially saying, eh, you win some, you lose some. I mean, what an awful thing to say about somebody else's life. And all these other people that are involved in this. Like, how low can he sink? And here's David, this man, supposedly after God's, I mean, God said he was a man after my own heart. And look at this. It's awful. And now, it looks like he gets away with it, right? Not so fast. <laughs> Let's read the last couple of verses, and then we'll finish up. It says, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. She probably had no idea this was all happening. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I was wondering if many of the people in that town thought that David was doing a real valiant thing, you know? Aw, he's such a good guy. Look at him taking care of that poor, you know, pregnant widow. God, David's such a good guy. Nobody knows it's his child. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. But as we see there in verse 27, he doesn't get away with anything, right? Because who knows about all this? God knows about it, right? He sees everything. The Bible says that everything is naked and open in front of God. And we're told there, you might want to uh, circle that, it displeased the Lord. Uh, if you have a study Bible, it might say uh, it was evil in the sight of God. Because right? it is what he did. And um, God's going to deal with David. And it actually, uh, I wouldn't say it's a good outcome, but there's resolution <laughs> In this. So read ahead in chapter 12 because we'll see how God deals with David uh, next time and, and how God deals with those of us who've, um, you know, done things we ought not be uh, doing. Well, I want to invite the worship team uh, back up to sing the last song for us and bless us. And as they make their way up, you know, the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. And later on in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's some commentary on this event in 1 Kings 15. And it says that David always did what was right in the eyes of God. And he didn't turn away from anything that God had commanded him to do. It says, except for the matter of Uriah the Hittite. You see, this is the smudge that's on the life record of David, and it's a really 
ugly smudge, right? And it's there forever. And so this is our time now as we kind of apply this to ourselves that I, I hope that you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, want to maintain your freedom <laughs> and not come under the bondage of sin. And the way to do that <laughs> is to stay on the path that God has for you, that we would do what he says. <laughs> and then when you're tempted, because you will be tempted, that you'll take the way of escape, that you won't just ignore the off-ramps because he gives us a chance here. Remember, all temptation is common to mankind. And there's a way out in every situation, no matter how bad it's getting, there's a way out. And remember this, and I'll close with this. God sees everything. <laughs> he keeps track of it. But the good news, you guys, is there is forgiveness. <laughs> and the reason there's forgiveness is because of what Jesus has done. Remember, he was nailed to the cross. And he paid it all for every sin, even these creepy things. And John said, if we will confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is such uh, good news. So if you are carrying around a bunch of guilt over something that you've done, maybe a long time ago, why not take care of it right now as we sing this last song that you would just go into the presence of God in your heart and just ask him to forgive you for it. If you're not a Christian yet, that you would ask for him to forgive you for everything and, and be part of his family. Put your trust in Jesus and, and do it right now. Be free. Let's stay free. <laughs> would you guys stand with me?